We are talking about uh, getting our priorities in order this in uh, 2019. And I mentioned last week, if you were here, if you're not just a quick uh, uh, reminder, um, our main priority in life is to our relationship with God. So we have our relationship with God and then our relationship with our family, specifically our spouse if we're married, then the church, we have to get these things in order. Uh, all these other things that we work on in 2019, don't bother working on them until you get your relationship with God in order. And so we wanna look at that one first. We wanna look at that first priority right now. And uh, we need to make sure that our relationship with God is in good condition. Went out on a, a date with my wife the other day. We've been married 17 years now. Uh, yeah, it's not bad, 17 years. Uh, so for the first time in 17 years since we've been married, I think for the first time in my whole life, we went to this really, uh, restaurant, I ordered a salad to eat. And uh, I've never done that before. I thought, why would you pay money for lettuce <laughs> uh, at a restaurant? And so I ordered the salad and my wife looks at me and she says, it's like I don't even know you anymore. <laughs> and <laughs> she's right, you know, this is... I am not the person that she married. And I told her that too. We kind of had a back and forth. I said, well, you're not the woman I fell in love with. Uh, we are, when we had a fine, it, was a, it wasn't combative, but we are different people than we were when we got married. In some ways, we're totally different people. Uh, we've changed. I'm a different person. She's a different person. I've mentioned this before. My wife has been married to five, at least five different guys. Um, they're all me, but... That's how it works. As we grow, especially in the Lord, we uh, look back on our lives and we think, boy, I'm, I'm a totally different person now. And we should be. We should be different per people than we were last year. We should be different people than we were 10 years ago, than we were 17 years ago. So how does this work then? How does our marriage work? Or, or not just our marriage. I'm not even talking about relationships today. But how do our lives work uh, when we're totally different people than we were? How does, that, how does that happen? Crystal's not the woman that I fell in love with. <laughs> She's something different now. I'm not the person that Crystal fell in love with. We're, we're totally different. Things change. People change. You change. Uh, hopefully you do. If, if, at least, if you don't, at least our circumstances change. Some things in our lives work out. Some things in our lives don't work out. Sometimes things fall apart. How do we keep on going? How do we keep on, it, it, you know, it's so easy for us to say, ah, we've made it. This is it. This is how it's going to be. But we all know that give it a week, give it a day, things are going to change. How do we keep on going? How do we deal with this change? How do we deal with things being different? How do we deal with us being different? That's the question I want to look at today. We have two options. There's the world's way and there's God's way. And I like very, this is very simple, and I like simple things, so there's going to be an easy sermon, um, but it's not going to be easy to hear. I mean, it's going to be easy to understand, but it's going to be, some of this is going to be very difficult to hear. So you can write me off if you want. If it helps you, go ahead and write me off. But if God is trying to speak to you, please don't write God off. But what does our world want to do? Our world wants to uh, hold on to those things, hold on to the good old days. Uh, we love nostalgia. Things have changed in our lives, and uh, sometimes we begrudgingly accept it, but a lot of us want to, and the world wants to get back to the way things were. I grew up in the 80s. I was a kid in the 80s, and all these kids in the 80s are growing up now, and they're all adults. And lo and behold, uh, everything that was cool in the 80s, they're trying to market again. And so I watched Transformers on TV, and now there's Transformers in the movies. And I watched, uh, there was Full House, and now they've got Full House back. And I watched Roseanne, and now Roseanne's back. And all this, I played Nintendo, and now they've got these little Nintendos they're selling. Why? Because all these 80s kids are adults now, and they know, everybody knows, oh, uh, they like nostalgia. Adults like going back to the way things were, and so these are all marketed. And we think about the good old days, and we wish, ah, things were better back then. Uh, but then when we look at the 80s, we realize, wait, the 80s were terrible. Uh, look at what we were wearing. Look what we were doing with our hair. The 80s were awful. Uh, maybe the problem isn't that the 80s were better. It's that you were just a dumb kid and you didn't know any better. Uh, we've, we've always been complaining about the good old days and how things are going downhill. And you can read Aristotle who is 400 years, more than 400 years before Jesus. And Aristotle complains about the youth of his day. And things are going downhill. 
and they're going downhill fast. Uh, medieval times, they complained uh, how, how things are getting worse and worse exponentially, they said. This is terrible. The next generation coming, they don't care about anything honorable. They drink, they smoke, they swear. You can read them, complain about how things are going downhill. And if we can only get back to the good old days, they said in medieval times. In Victorian times, they talked about these kids' fashion today. Can you believe the clothes the kids are wearing? Meanwhile, everybody's wearing stuff like this. And the old people said, if we could just get back to that. That's when things were good. Nowadays, who knows what they're wearing? And we just pine for these good old days. That's the way of the world. We, uh, things have changed and we don't like it. We want to hold on to the good old days. And please take that guy off. <laughs> so that's the world's way. Well, what's the problem? Well, God's way is different. God wants to, like Crystal said, and we didn't coordinate this, but it worked out perfectly. God, way, God wants to do a new thing. The series is called Making All Things New. God wants to do a new thing, uh, but the world and we in the world keep trying to hold on to something that has passed. God wants us new, but we want to hold on to the old. He wants to do a new work in us, and we want to go back to the old. God doesn't want to make you old, though. He wants to make you new. He doesn't want you to have just nostalgia for the way things were, and oh, it's too bad, it'll never be that way. God says, I'm going to make even better things happen to come. I want to make things new. God wants to do something in your life that's even better than where your life was. God wants to do something in your marriage that's even better than your marriage has ever been. God wants to do something in this church that's even better than where this church ever was. But we won't get that if we're trying to hold on to the way things were and go back to the old. God says, I've got something better than the old. I am making all things new. Amen? Last week, Haggai, we looked at the prophet Haggai. Haggai was rebuilding the temple. The Israelites had been taken away into captivity, and there was a king of, of Persia that allowed some of the Israelites to go back to their land that had been devastated and destroyed, rebuild their houses, and rebuild their temple. And if you uh, want to listen to that, if you weren't here, it's all online. Um, and the t but the temple got destroyed, and Haggai says, wait a second, we're neglecting the temple of God, and we're working on all our own temples. We're working on all our own kingdom. We have to get our priorities in order, Haggai said. Let's work on the temple of God. And he convinced the Israelites to do so, and they rebuilt the temple. And you know what they said? When some of the older people saw the new temple, some of the older people said, well, it's not as good as the old one. <laughs> uh, but God says, I want to do something even, really, even better than just this physical temple that you've built. You guys have no idea. We're going to go back a little bit this week. I'm going to do it a little bit out of order. We had to preach on Haggai first because Haggai is about priorities, and we had to talk about priorities first. But we're going to rewind the timeline a little bit, and we're going to go to the prophet Ezekiel, who was a little bit before Haggai. Ezekiel came as the uh, Israelites were being taken away into captivity. So they're going to rebuild the temple. That's going to happen. But right now, in Ezekiel's time, their nation is destroyed. The temple is leveled. Their houses, their homes, their farmlands, everything is gone, burnt up, and they are taken away into captivity. And everything is ruined with Ezekiel's time, in Ezekiel's time. And everything is hopeless. And Ezekiel uh, has a very tough job. Obviously, he's got to prophesy to the Israelites during this very difficult time. And there's some amazing prophecies of Ezekiel. We're going to look at one in chapter 36. It's in your insert there. But Ezekiel wants to tell the Israelites, he wants to tell God's people, uh, wait a second, you are not hopeless. Things are not too far gone. I know everything looks hopeless. Everything's in ruins. Everything fell apart. But you are never too far gone for God. God can do amazing works uh, far beyond anything that we can imagine. And Ezekiel says, uh, God is going to bring us back, but here's the deal. We are not going to go back to the same old thing. In order for God to do a new work in you, God is going to need to make us all new people. And this is what Ezekiel's prophecy is all about. I want, I'd like to read it there in Ezekiel 36. 
God says to his people, he says, for I will take you out of the nations. And the nations were the people that took them away and uh, destroyed everything. I'm gonna take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you. This is amazing. This is God speaking. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. And then you will live in the land that I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. Let's pray. Lord, we, uh, we need to hear these words from you. Lord, as, as tough as it is, the world wants to pull us back. Help us to look forward to this. Help us, give us hope that nothing is too far gone, that you can't breathe new life into it. We ask that you would speak to us today wherever you would uh, have us listen. And we give you permission in Jesus' name to do so. Amen. Well, Here's this amazing prophecy about God not only bringing them back, but making them new people, right? Giving them a new heart, giving them a new spirit, giving them his spirit. And this is an amazing thing for the people in the Old Testament. They, I don't think they would have even fully understood what Ezekiel was talking about. Um, we know from the New Testament, and we're, uh, we're living... Jesus has come in between Ezekiel and us. That is, Ezekiel was on the scene in the Old Testament, then Jesus came, and now here we are on the other side of Jesus. And when Jesus came, he, one of the main things he came to do was to fulfill this very prophecy of Ezekiel. That is, Jesus wants to prepare his people so God's spirit can be in us. Now, if we were to take an Old Testament person, maybe a person from the time of Ezekiel, and get them in a time machine and bring them here, I think they would be blown away at our relationship that we have with God. Think about the person in the Old Temple, that for them to meet God, they would go to the temple, uh, they would bring their sacrifices to the temple, they would talk to a priest, and the priest would talk to God for them, and the prophet would talk to, uh, from God to the people. It's very kind of... Um, it's a different relationship. And now an Old Testament person sitting here in the service today would be amazed. He would say, wait, you're telling me that every single one of God's people here have direct access to God? Have God's spirit dwelling in them? And we would say, yeah, what's the big deal? We kind of take it for granted. But this is an amazing difference, from the, a shift from the Old Testament to the New Testament. God's spirit had always been with, with the people of God. As uh, God took them out of the land of Egypt, God's spirit would guide the Israelites through the wilderness. God's spirit came upon the Israelites every once in a while. He was there in the temple. God's spirit was there present. Um, and if God had special tasks for prophets or certain people, it says God's spirit would, would come upon that person and guide that person for a time. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he's saying, God's spirit is going to be in you now. And his disciples, Jesus' disciples, his followers would question Jesus, going, what does this mean? We know about God's spirit, but what do you mean? What's the difference? And Jesus says in John, what was with you will be in you. And I can't God imagine the disciples could just scratch their heads. Um, what does this mean? God's spirit wants to dwell in us now? Uh, and maybe we ask, what's the big deal? Why do we need this? Uh, maybe, like I said, we take it for granted. What do we need God's spirit for in us now if, you know, Jesus came, he paid for our sins, and one day we'll get to heaven? Great. Uh, well, I keep saying this week after week after week. God doesn't want us just sitting around here on earth and then one day we go to heaven. God wants to bring heaven to us he wants to bring his spirit to us now. He doesn't want transformation sometime in the future when you die. He wants to be with you now. He wants to give you something new now. He wants to be your God now. He wants to have a relationship with you right now. And so his spirit is going to dwell in us, Ezekiel says, and that Jesus prepared a way for that to happen. 
And we know uh, through the story of Jesus that after Jesus died and was resurrected, he ascended into heaven. The disciples waited around for a couple days and we talk about Pentecost. And this is the the day when the Holy Spirit indwelled, filled up the people of God. And since that day, we now have God's Spirit dwelling in us. He's not just with us, he's in us. Amen? Now, what does this mean? Well, God, according to this prophecy in Ezekiel, is not interested in people with hearts of stone and old stubborn spirits. If God is going to do a new thing in us now, then he needs to transform us. He needs to do a work in our heart. God says, I want you to be a people who doesn't, don't just follow my rules begrudgingly. I guess I better do this. I need to give you a new heart so that you want to follow me. I need to give you a new heart so you want to have a relationship with me, so you want to spend time with me. It's, I think about my relationship with Crystal. Uh, the relationship can be very dry as dust if I just say, well, okay, let's, um, I, I suppose you want to spend time with me, fine, let's check this off the list, I'll spend time with you. Have I done enough time? Okay, good, let me get back to my own thing. That's one kind of relationship, but it's another kind of relationship when I desire to be with my wife when I want to be with her, when I want to hear from her. That's a totally different relationship. God says, that's the relationship I want to have with you. But in order for that to happen, you have to have a new heart, a heart that wants to follow versus a heart that has to be told what to do, a heart that isn't stone cold and stubborn and unchanging, but a heart that wants to uh, be warm and, and know about God. A heart that isn't just wanting to go back to the way things were, but a heart that wants to move forward. A heart that doesn't begrudgingly go to church because my spouse makes me go to church. But a heart that wants a close, closer relationship with God. Some nudges out there I saw. Uh, but God can only do so much with an old heart. So he, and he can only do so much with an old spirit. So he has to give us a new heart. We need a new spirit. And this is what God wants to do. Uh, And this is where God's way is different from the world's way because God can do something the world can't. God can make all things new. Well, the world can't do that. The world can just look at a dead thing and say, too bad, let's move on. God can make something new out of that. He can bring to life things that are dead. And he goes to great lengths to show us this throughout the scriptures. Jesus is on the scene at one point and I talked about Mary and Martha last week. Uh, Mary and Martha have got a house, and uh, uh, there's a, a man, a friend of Jesus, is named Lazarus. And Lazarus got really sick, and Lazarus ended up dying. Well, when Lazarus died, Jesus was far off in another city. And while Lazarus was still alive, people sent messengers to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, you've got to get back to Lazarus quick, because if you don't get here quick, uh, Lazarus isn't going to make it. And Jesus said, thank you. And he kind of hung around for a bit as his disciples said, Jesus, aren't we going to get up and aren't we going to go? And Jesus said, it'll be fine. Don't worry. And Jesus took his time, finished up his stuff, and then eventually made his way to Bethany. But in the world's eyes, it was too late. And in Martha's eyes, it was too late. And so Jesus comes up and Lazarus has been dead for four days at this point. And she comes up to Jesus and she says, Jesus, you knew he was sick. You knew this was coming. Now it's too late. So thanks for coming, but it's too late for you to do anything. And Jesus says to her, don't you know about the resurrection? Don't you know about new life? She says, yeah, I'm aware of that, but it's too late for Lazarus. And I think Jesus wanted to wait a little bit so he would show everybody there and he would show all of us that it doesn't matter how dead something is, doesn't matter how far gone something is. It doesn't matter to Jesus at all. We're talking about the person who spoke existence into being. This four days dead is not an issue. And they say to Jesus, in one of my favorite verses in the the King James, they translate it this way. They say, but Jesus, he stinketh. (laughs) Jesus, this, you don't understand, is rotting. It's not just dead, it's rotting. And Jesus says, Lazarus, come up. Lazarus, get up. And Lazarus walks out. Jesus, it takes Jesus two words, and it's new. 
The world may look at something that stinketh, <laughs> and we may look at the things in our life that are too far gone, that's past. What's God? God couldn't possibly do anything. And God says, I created the universe in a breath. I can't make something new out of your life. I can't make something new out of this relationship. Well, you're, you've got a very small idea of God, if that's the case. Ezekiel, in the very next chapter, uh, wants to explain this to his people because Ezekiel gave this prophecy and the people couldn't believe it. They said, God wants to do something new in our nation? Well, thanks a lot, God. Why didn't you show up before everything got destroyed? Why didn't you show up before our temple was leveled and the houses were gone and, and we've been taken off into captivity? And God says, I can make new out of everything that's destroyed. And the people say, I don't believe it. Not for us. It's too far gone for us. Things are past now. It's too late. And in the very next chapter of Ezekiel, I encourage you to read the whole thing. Ezekiel gives this amazing uh, image. He gets a prophecy from God. And Ezekiel says, here's what I see. I saw a valley and it was filled with bones. He says, dry bones. So it's not just, they're not like fresh, like bones with meat on them, <laughs> with juice in them. They're dry these things are dead. There's no hope for these bones. And Ezekiel said, but then here's what I saw. The bones came together and the ligaments came together and the tendons came together and then muscles came and grew on them and skin grew on them. And out of those dry bones, God made a brand new person. Out of those dry bones, God built up a brand new nation. Something that the world would say is impossible. We need to move on. It's too far gone. It's too late. God says, it's never too far gone for me. And he says in Ezekiel, I just want to read these last verses of his prophecy. Uh, Ezekiel 37, verse 11 through 14, it says, then God, then Yahweh, God said to me, son of man, he's talking to Ezekiel, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone, we are cut off. Therefore, Ezekiel, prophesy and say to my people. This is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to, if you're too far gone, here, listen to what God says, then I'm going to open up your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Isn't it amazing? Uh, that there's nothing too far gone from God. Maybe you feel like the Israelites today. It's too far gone, it's, too, it's, too, it's dead, it's gone. And God says, oh, then I'll open up the grave and pull you out. You are not done. I can give a new spirit. You, Crystal shared uh, the story of the, the woman we were at a funeral with just yesterday, 87 years old. God is not done with her. He was waiting through all sorts of trials this woman went through and finally and she questioned, her daughter shared the story, why am I still here? She had gone through two aneurysms, uh, all sorts of things that would uh, typically have, people would not survive through. And she wondered, what am I still doing here? She said she walked out of a church one Sunday and she says, now I know. God was waiting for me to meet him. She goes, and now I've met him. God, you are never too far gone. And you might say, uh, as I do when I hear stuff like this, well, this is great, thank you, but I'm already following Jesus. I already have the Holy Spirit. Um, I already have things, and it seems like, uh, it seems like it's not that big a deal, you know, kind of a big whoop. And here's where the message starts to get a little different, or not different, it gets a little difficult. Uh, so we need to listen closely here, and I'm sorry to have to say some of the stuff that I'm gonna say. But here's how this works with God. We have our old life, then uh, the old life is gone, there's a death, and then a new life comes. So we have our old self, then the old self is gone, and God wants to bring a new life. We look at Jesus. Jesus is here, Jesus comes, and Jesus doesn't just bring the Spirit with him. He doesn't just bring the new, I mean, he has the new life in him, but we don't get it. Why? What has to happen first? A death has to happen first. And so Jesus dies. And then there's a period of time where his followers are trying to figure things out. They're mourning. They're, they, they have to readjust what's going on. This is not what we thought was going to happen. And as they're learning this new uh, life, Jesus brings new life to them. 
He's risen from the dead. And uh, Mary Magdalene does something very interesting. She's at the, at the tomb of Jesus, and Jesus, uh, the resurrected Jesus comes to her, and Mary says, oh, good. We're glad you're back because we didn't know what we were going to do. Now we can go back to the, the way things were. We can go back to Galilee. You can continue to teach. And she holds on to Jesus, and, and Jesus says, Mary, don't hold on to me. He says, don't cling to me. I need to ascend to the Father. And they're shocked by this. What do you mean? You're going to leave us now? And Jesus has to reassure his disciples. And he says, it's actually better for me to go to heaven because I'm going to then pour out my new spirit on you. So where we're like Mary. We like to cling on to that old life. Oh, the old life, can we still get it? Jesus says, no, don't cling on to it. Something newer and something better is coming. We need to stop clinging on to it, though. And when, it, when Jesus ascends to heaven, then the new spirit comes. Now, I'm going to connect the dots now, if you haven't done this yet. We are new people. Like I said in the beginning, I'm, I've been at least several different people <laughs> over the last couple years. God continues to do things in me. I continue to change. I'm a new person now. But what does that mean? It means there's also been a lot of deaths. If there's a not a lot of new life, then that means that also a lot of deaths have come. What does that mean for us? We need to not cling to the old, but we need to readjust. There needs to be a period of mourning and readjustment, right, for the new to come. You have been many different people as well. The issue for many of us is um, for we don't get the grace we need because we're clinging on to old dead things, if God is making you new, if you're a new person, that's great. But many of us are carrying around a bunch of corpses that we need to get rid of. You know, that's one of the reasons we baptize people. One of the, one of the symbols as we uh, put someone un under the water and bring them up, it symbolizes death and new life. It symbolizes also a cleansing. That is, you have been made new now. Let's wash the old corpse off so you're not walking around with it. And whenever we're tempted to grab on to those old dead things, we need to let them go. We need to mourn them, yes, and let them go. Because sometimes we're not accessing the grace we need because we're too busy looking for the wrong kind of grace, the grace for that old life that has, that has come and gone. Our old self, though, is dead. Uh, and I'm sorry to say this. And we do need a time of mourning and some of us are in that period of, of readjustment, adjustment, and that's good. But when we have a funeral, um, we have it for a reason. We need a time of mourning, a time of readjustment, and then we need to bury it. It needs to be done now. I want to read a letter uh, from a man uh, from the book. Uh, it's from a book called The Holy Longing. He's writing to a pastor here. I thought it would fit in well. So if you'll, if you'll allow me to read this letter, it's going to take just a minute. Uh, they went on a, retreat, a men's retreat at their church. And after the retreat, he got this letter. He says, I came on this retreat because I needed something new in my life. I'm sick of myself, this man writes. That's what it comes down to. I'm 47 years old, and it's time I got into my own skin and stopped living, uh, he swears, Louis, he stopped living a bleeping daydream. My daydream started when I was a little kid growing up on a farm in northern Alberta. I remember listening to hockey broadcasts on our radio and hearing the announcer shout, he shoots, he scores, and that was me. In my daydream, I was going to be the famous hockey star, and it almost happened. I was a very good player, and for three years, I played tier one junior hockey. That's the best hockey outside of the NHL. And I was a star, too, good enough to have some professional teams interested in me. So at age 19, I tried to play pro hockey. The sad part is I wasn't quite big enough and I wasn't quite good enough. By age 22, the dream was over. I was told I would never make it. But I was young then and had been a big star in my little town, so I went home and began, for lack of another job, to work at the local Safeway store. Well, he says, it's 25 years later now, and I'm still working at the same store. Along the line, I got married, basically a good marriage, and we have four kids, all healthy and pretty decent. But this is the sad part. I should be happy. 
I have a good wife, a good marriage, good kids. Our house is paid for. My job is boring but secure. I'm healthy. And probably a lot of people in the world would trade lives with me. But as best I can describe it, for these last 25 years, I've not been inside my own skin. I've been too restless. I'm still living that bleeping daydream, always thinking to myself, what if? What if I had made the National Hockey League? What if I hadn't quit, my, quit school so young? What if I hadn't married so young? What if I wasn't stuck in this godforsaken little town in the middle of nowhere? You know, all my life, I've nursed a daydream that I would be big time, big star, big city, big salary, my name and lights. Well, look at me now. I'm small time, small salary, small town, small everything, except my, the size of my waist, he says. That's the only thing that's not small. He says, I had a realization in church last year. I don't know what Sunday it was, but the pastor started talking about how Jesus' body went up to heaven and a thought struck me. That's what has to happen to my daydream. I have to let it go up to heaven, just like Jesus' old body. It was a good dream, but it's over. I have to stop living that dream so I am not so bleeping restless and can get inside my own skin. I have every reason to be happy, but I'm not. There must be people like me, 47 years old, 45 pounds overweight, living in small towns and working in Safeway stores who are happy, and I want to be one of them. It's a shame for my wife and kids, who are really good, and in the end, that's the only thing that's important. It's a shame that I haven't been there for them like I should have been. I need to be who I am and get inside my own life instead of trying to live somebody else's life or trying to live a dream that was over a long time ago. And then the author kind of summarizes it. He says, this man is ready for the ascension. And what he means is this man is ready to let the old self go up to heaven. He has had 25 years of grieving and adjustment, and now he is ready to let the old go so that he can receive a new spirit. A spirit for someone who is 47 years old, overweight, and living and working in a small town in northern Canada. Some of the happiest people in the world fit that description, as do some of the most restless people in the world. Happiness and restlessness are not determined by who makes it big time and who ends up in a small town. They depend on whether or not we are clinging to the dead and whether or not we have received a new spirit. Well, this, I told you this is tough, but this is where you are right now. It's Sunday, it's January something in 2019, and you're sitting here in Center Point Church in Howell, Michigan, uh, and maybe you didn't want this, but this is where you are. This is you. I don't know what you're clinging to or what the world has thrown in you at you, but it may be time to stop clinging to the old. Maybe you didn't want it to be this way, or maybe you're ashamed or embarrassed, but God's new spirit can't do its work until you acknowledge, this is me. This is where I am. This is who I am. And there's good news. God has grace for right where you're at. God has grace for 40-year-olds. God has grace for 50-year-olds. Uh, but we're not going to get it if we still keep clinging and trying to get the grace that 20-year-olds need. You don't need that grace. You need a different kind. 20 was good. Uh, it's good to be 20 but it's good to be 30. 30 was good, but it's good to be 40 too. It's good to be 50 too. God can make all things new. God has grace for every conceivable area of your life. He has grace for divorced people, depressed people, anxious people. But you have to say, like this man did, this is where I am. God, this is the grace I need for where I am right now. This is the life that I live so I can live a new life and stop looking for the, a different kind of grace. God has grace for the unemployed. If you're unemployed, that's fine. God has grace for you. If you're sick, if you've wandered off the path, good news, God has grace for sick people. God has grace for people that have wandered off the path. We need to acknowledge it. 
Maybe you're greedy. Maybe you're an addict. That's fine. God has grace for addicts. You need to come to terms with it, though. Maybe you're attracted to the same sex. Maybe you're looking at some pretty terrible things online. Good news for you today. God has grace for you. Stop trying to get grace for some old dead thing and start living in your life now so God can make something new. He wants to make you even better than the old was ever, has ever been. Amen? I want to close with the story of Joni, uh, Johnny Erickson Tata. She's a, a Christian, a kind of a motivational speaker. Johnny Erickson Tata had, a, uh, unfortunately, a tragic accident uh, when she was a teenager, left her, I think it was a swimming accident. She dove into uh, shallow water and, uh, and broke her neck and it left her a quadriplegic for life. And uh, she goes around talking about the grace and the blessings of God. And she's an amazing, incredible woman. She tells a story about how um, she was with her family and her family, oh, during a family reunion, were watching these old uh, eight millimeters they were watching how things used to be. And she was there with her husband and she saw her teenage self on the screen, on the projector screen. And she saw herself running around in fields and riding horses. And she said, I noticed my shoes were worn out. And she said, I broke down in tears realizing I'll never wear out a pair of shoes ever again. I can't, I can't use my legs. And her husband said, he came up to her and said, you know what, Let's, maybe we should stop this. And she says, no, no, you know what? There was a time in my life where, yes, we would have had to stop this. I would not have been able to watch these old movies because there was a time in my life when I just was angry. I wanted to get back to that old thing. She says, but now that I've been walking with God all these years, I don't look back to the old. She says, I think about the legs I'm going to have. I think about when I'm going to be with God, I'm going to do so much more than run, she says. We need to stop looking to the past, stop clinging to it, and let what needs to die, die. Um, we need to mourn it. We need to readjust. And then, praise God, we need to accept that new life that he has for us. God wants better for us in 2019, and he will bring it. The spirit you need right now is the spirit God has ready for you. We just have to be willing to accept it. I ask the worship team to close us out in a song, if we could listen. We want to ask the Holy Spirit to come. We want to welcome uh, him into our lives, into this place. Amen. And change us. Do something new this morning. Will you stand? You're welcome to come to the altar or sit if you want to. But let's have a few moments and ask God to come and move and do something new within us. Nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord by your presence Lord there's nothing worth more that could ever Living hope.
sea of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord we invite you in spoken to us in this place this morning. I pray that we can leave the things that are old, that are dead, that need to be restored. I pray that we would leave them here, God. We would bury them here. Let today be the day that we stick a flag in it and say it is gone and we are moving towards the new things that you are doing. God, allow your Holy Spirit to come be alive within us, God. We welcome you in our lives. No longer are we going to take it for granted, but let it refresh us and renew us day by day, God. Let us be new people every day that you are doing something new in, that, that we would wake up excited to see what you have for us today, Father. God, let us come week by week and encourage one another that, that you are doing something powerful among us. And we will give you the glory. We will give you the glory because you are good. You are good. Father, I pray as we leave this place that we would remember the words that you've spoken, that maybe even that simple tune of you make all things new will come to us all week long and encourage us until we meet again as your family to hear what you have for us next. We love you, God. And we give it over to you in your precious holy name. Amen. Amen, church.